I've really been looking forward to this one today. I'm here at Heath House in the middle of Newmarket, just about to interview Sir Mark Prescott. This is the one. For us at Grassroots Racing, it's lovely to have the chance to interview someone like yourself. Um, and what we would like to do, I've watched many interviews that you've done. Um, I'd like to start from the beginning, the beginning. So as you was growing up, um, and where you, your background, and you're such an interesting person when I look at so many things, but you've got to realize where we're coming from. This is an amazing opportunity. So thanks for having us today. And we'll start from the beginning. And, and Yeah, well, I, I got interested because I suppose a pretty girl down the road was riding and, and, and it seemed to be a good thing to do. And I went to a very nice old lady called Mrs. Jackson and she taught me to ride. And I liked riding so much that I was, I was 12, I suppose, I'd cycle down there every day and muck out all these horses. And so when it came to paying her for the riding lessons, she, she wouldn't take any money. Um, and because uh, she said I was helping so much. And so my father, my marvellous stepfather actually, uh, took her to the races by way of thank you because she was mad on racing. And I went along very reluctantly and I was 11 or 12 and um, we stood by the last at Newton Abbott and um, I was so small I couldn't see over the fence and they came hurtling in and a tremendous noise and crack and, and this horse crashed down in front of me and I was right on the rail so it fell as close as you are to me now because in other sports it's also far away and it crashed down on top of the jockey it brought down two more and obviously he was dead. I just looked at this fellow, you know, he's just clearly dead. And the other horses galloped away and then he stood up very, very slowly and he said, fucking hell, and <laughs> chucked the whip into the crowd. And I thought, what a man. And I never wanted to do anything else again. And his name was Tim Brookshaw. Uh, and the horse was called April Steak. And when uh, Chris Pitt was writing a book on Tim Brookshaw, he rang me and asked me about this. And I said, it's probably all bollocks, you know, when you, you've, you've probably remembered all, it's all childhood stuff. Absolutely the horse, the race, everything I had remembered right. So it made a tremendous, was tremendous I was about 11 or 12. Jesus. And uh, I just never wanted to be anything else but a jockey. And of course I made a very bad jockey and had a very bad fall. And uh, so eventually I came here and worked for Mr. War, which would be 56 years ago. Um, and he was a very tough man and everybody said, oh, you'll never get on with him. But I'd had a very tough father, so... Um, tough days. Yes, and I, I wasn't as afraid of Mr. War as everybody else was. I found him a marvellous man to work for. I had two and a half fantastic years. And he then became ill and I took over the licence and I was only 21. So everybody who worked for me was older than me. Wow. which was quite a sort yeah, of thing. In them days, yeah. And the old trainers did everything they could to be difficult. They absolutely hated me. They reported me to the jockey club for breaking rules. They just made my life a, a, a misery. And uh, I was the youngest trainer in Newmarket by 19 years. Johnny Winter was the next youngest, and I'm afraid he's been dead for years. <laughs> um, and um, they just made my life so difficult. And then after a couple of years, Henry Cecil started and Michael Stout and Luca Kimani and all these very good trainers started as young men and they couldn't hate everybody, the old boys, so I was, the old, I was like spared the, uh, Like that. the jockey club and the... No, it was the old trainers, they were right. horrible. They right. were really did their best to make your life difficult. Can I, I read actually that um, you had a very bad fall. Yes, I was in hospital for 18 months. Was you? Um, I broke my back at Y, which was a... Um, under rules, why but was down in in Kent, and I went to Oswe I went to Oswest Re Orthopaedic, which was fantastic. But I'd been in um, Ashford Cottage Hospital before, and if you have a crash on the M25, you want to miss Ashford Cottage Hospital if you can. <laughs> uh, but when I got to Oswest Street, it was marvellous. Uh, but it was 18 months before I walked out. Wow! And very interestingly. Um, almost the first person I met in Oswestry was Tim Brookshaw, the jockey who'd had the terrible fall right. at Newton Abbott. And he was a paraplegic. 
and he came to see me. And, and you I, still wanted to get involved? And, yeah, well, I was, by then I had been, you see, and I said to him, um, you're the reason I'm here, you know, because <laughs> you were my hero. Yeah. Unbelievable. So, like, that was um, 1970 you started training, was it? Yeah, 69. 69. I, when Mr. War became ill, and then I had my own licence in 1970. So you've you've seen it in, what's that, 52 years? It's the 53rd lot of years, I'm afraid these are. So know. when we complain about the BHA and this is wrong and that's wrong, you've seen everything, every scenario? Yes, bit by bit, I yeah. suppose. We're all I've seen all the sort of big changes, I think. Do you have any involvement in the, in any of the no, BHA? No, I've always kept clear of the politics. I think everybody should do something for the sport. And uh, my role was I ran Newmarket Heath for 46 years. Right, right. Um, I was, yeah, I know you were involved with the Jockey Club. Yeah, and I was involved with them through running the, the Heath. But my responsibility stopped with the Heath. I, I never got involved with the rules or anything like that. So then you came here and then you was started training from here. I took over from Mr. War. We had about 30 odd horses. And um, How old was this place when you came? Well, Frampton trained here, we know, in 1666. It was the first professional trainer, was, was it? It was the first yeah. yard ever. Yeah. And that's why it's in such a good place, because it's no good being the first <laughs> if you don't <laughs> you put it in the right the... spot. Yes, so <laughs> Frampton put it in the right spot. And uh, that's Frampton behind you now. Um, and he'd have approved of me. There's a famous picture of him and he's got a a greyhound and a, and a fighting cock and was obviously a thoroughly good man yeah, yeah so so the history of um frampton uh, sorry from mr frampton the history of heath house goes you, from there goes from there and you've been you've been here ever since and and um yeah and step i've enjoyed by step. it i've enjoyed it all this um, was your first training yard yes the whole yes, place yes yeah you didn't you didn't start off small or no i started off with 30 horses Wow. And um, how did that come about in them days then? It's well, because Mr. Wall became ill ah. and he went to Lordship and Edgerton Studs to manage them for Lady Macdonald Buchanan, who was our biggest owner. And I took over and trained the, trained the horses. So Mr. Wall was managing Edgerton when there was Royal Palace, Abernant, Pal you know, some great stallions were there at that time, Brigadier Gerard. Right. And was, in them days, was it all... Let's say for, for us, I'm going to say posh people, but was it all upper class people? A lot of posh people, but it was all falling down because the posh people now didn't have the money to keep up everywhere. Right. So before Sheikh Mohammed came, all the big studs were really in a pretty poor state of affairs. Uh, taxation when I started training was 19 and 6 in the pound. Wow. You imagine that. Lucky there was plenty of cash about it. Yeah, so the, 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 but the big families were selling, selling, selling. Right. Um, and it was a period of transition, really. Um, and uh, uh, tremendously high death duties. So if two people died close to one another, that was the end of the family, really. Unbelievable. So the big estates were going. And uh, new people were coming in. But racing was in a, in a bad state then. Um, Although it was popular with the, the public and, and, and the, putting their spot on the newspaper and having a bet on their way to, from the work in the factory and all that sort of stuff. It's very popular with the, with the public. Uh, but its finances and everything, as now, uh, were going through a very bad, very bad period until yeah. the betting levy board started to put money in. Um, it was run on a very local basis. Um, very few meetings. When I started there were only uh, 17 courses with a watering system. So if you look now today at the brown courses, you saw Ascot and you saw the, yeah. the jump track on the... Well that's what you were racing on. Well, yeah, that's... On, the... on, on all except for 17 tracks. Yeah. So there was a different kind of horses, different kind of racing. Um, at the yearling sales the first thing you asked yourself is, will this horse go on firm ground? because 70% of the racing no was, on, was on firm ground, flat racing. Flat racing was a firm ground sport. Wow, so it's a completely different way of looking yes, at horses. Yes, or where the racing came in, watering came in, slacker pastons, flatter footed horses could now earn, a, earn their living. Yeah. But in those days, so the thoroughbred developed very, very quickly to uh, to cope with the new condition. You see, would you say the thoroughbred today is a completely different horse than back then? Not completely different, but he's heavier, slacker past and uh, needs a bit more give. Um, you know, he's changed Softer. with the times, yes. Maybe, 
but they were lighter framed. Uh, many more were, were straight in front, many more with small boxy feet. Um, yes, it, it was. You only, have to, you only have to look at the photographs of the great horses to yeah. see how they have changed. Why would you say the, uh, and you might be able to explain this to me, but when you see the old paintings of horses in the 1800s, yeah. they've got a big long neck. And, yeah, and thin. And thin. Light and, bones. Was, did they look like that? Yes, they did. Wow. Because we, we've got Eclipse's skeleton. Eclipse, the first great racehorse. We have his skeleton. So we know what he looked like. He was straight in front, he had very little bone, he was only 15'2", and he went on rock hard ground. He was winning heats, four mile heats, two in a day. Well, that, uh, that's, no watering, you know, he was a different kind of horse. That explains a lot to me. I look at them paintings and think, yeah. well, that can't be good. It, that's it right. didn't look like that. That's right. And everybody also, they go to the jockey club and see the paintings of Warren Hill and King Charles out and say, it was never as steep as that. It was, because in those days they used the far side of Warren Hill coming up from the Cheverly Road. Right. So right. where those There's paintings are done, angle, it's yeah. a different angle. I've actually got a few yeah. of them paintings, yeah. yeah. And you can't, people can never orientate it right to get the church in the background. That's because it was painted down into Cheverly. Ah. Before we talk about a few more horses, I'd like to talk about your sports that you enjoy outside of um, horse racing. Mainly coursing. Yeah, coursing was my great love. Well, coursing was a. Um, I got into coursing through greyhounds, yes, taking course. greyhounds to watch to yeah. make them keen, yeah. and and I had lots of people there that said they knew. Oh yeah, I know some Art Prescott. I know some. And I'd just like to ask you a question. If this was, I think it was East Anglia Coursing Club. Uh, well, I used to run the Newmarket. And the lady's club, name, she was England. eighty all that time yeah. ago, was Dolly Gwynn. Yeah, she she dogs. She was. Um, uh, down in Essex, Colchester way. Yeah, yeah, see? Yeah, yeah. That's unbelievable. I've, and, I've got, must ask my And I think it was called the Colchester Coursing Club, and right. I think she ran it. And they were always in trouble for breaking the rules. And We used to know, take our dogs yeah. to watch with a yeah. muzzle on and yeah. just to get them keen. And, yeah, and see the real thing. Yeah, yeah, see the real so thing. That, that was good. Now, I ran the Waterloo Cup for 17 years, which was fascinating. And, um, you know, because the Waterloo Cup in up till 1927 was worth twice as much as the Derby. Really? Up until 1927. Wow. Twice as much as the Derby. And right up till 1927, it had the largest paying spectator crowd in the world for any sport. 100,000 paid, paid to go. Whereas at Epsom, you had a million people, but of course the middle's free. Yeah, yeah. But, but at Waterloo Cup, they all paid. Unbelievable. So, um, and it was fascinating to take it over and, and to try and keep it going. And we got the crowds up again. I mean, when it became illegal, the, the, um, the crowd on the last day was ten or 11,000 people, you know. So it was still enormously popular. Is it, is it um, still, still going in, in Ireland? In still Ireland, going yeah. Ireland. Clonmel in Ireland is a really, big. really big event. Do you make the effort and go? I always go. Unbelievable. Never, never, never miss. Um, and what was the problem? With, I suppose it was the... Um, well, I don't know what you'd call them, but there's obviously protesters and... The animal rights yeah. in England, yes, and they banned hunting as well. Um, and it w it's a warning to us with other sports that... Um, it's coming. It's, it's coming. Yeah. People's views are changing um, and uh, we've got to realise that uh, we've got to work at it. Yeah, yeah. We've got to work at it. And I mean, the ban on coursing was, from the hare's point of view, was catastrophic. Um, I mean, at, uh, at Swaffham they shot 3,000 hares the first day of the ban. 3,000 they shot the first day. And if you'd course for another 100 years, you wouldn't have killed as many. No. I so, I mean, from the point of view of, if you're interested in hares, the, 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 the ban was completely, completely disastrous for hares. Uh, if it was good for, because it changed people's views, uh, if it's the people you're worried about, well, I don't know. That's up to other people to judge. But yeah. as far as the hares and the dogs were concerned, it was no good. Yeah, yeah. It just seems to me that the people that are all... It's the people that are, are complaining, it, they always get noticed rather than the yes. people that have not and, got... and they opinion. didn't know much. And the fascinating thing was that when it came to the arguments about coursing was that the last three directors of the League Against Cruel Sports two of them changed their mind and realised they were wrong because it was a question of finding out enough about it. It was complex. Yeah. It's rather like the argument for keeping the bomb. You know, it's an easy argument to say, why should anyone have an atomic bomb? 
the the contra argument is that there hasn't been a world war since 1945 because of the bomb yeah yeah um and it's the same with the field sports that the the actually the the so-called prey species were better off with sport than without because the farmers looked after them and i've got to say when when i used to go coursing the people the actual sport it was phenomenal it was yeah, lovely nice to be people. out in the open countryside nice and yeah it was good lovely gentle people yeah, you know and yeah. they were supposed to be sadistic maniacs you couldn't meet nicer no people. dolly green yeah. at the time she was 80 when i was involved yeah. and she used to be out there marching along and yeah yeah. And children used to come out and beat. And I remember that at the club here, and they used to have a day off and, and come out beating. And they were all sort of four, tw tw nine to 14, and they were all full of life and screaming. And out they come in the beaters' wagon. And at the end of the day, 3 30, there wasn't a peep out of them. And they went home and they went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> they were no, no trouble to anyone. They'd had a fantastic day. Brilliant. Did you ever uh, move on to greyhound racing? I trained dogs early on i had 40 dogs in, at slough on the track Did when you? i was about 18 because yeah. one of our members said i remember mark prescott coming to south end yeah yeah and i um i went on laurels with a good dog did you um what, but in you, those is, days is this during while you yeah well, i was working for frank cundle then right so but i could work you can't believe what you could do at that <laughs> age i mean i'm sure you did with all, yeah. setting up all your businesses but i used to be at mr cundle's at five and unlock the yard and then I'd be there until half past 11, 12 o'clock. And then trials at Slough were at one. So I'd be there for trials until two in the afternoon. Come back for evening stables, do evening stables, just get there for the first race, seven o'clock. I mean, and then you finish up 10 o'clock and then you've got the dogs to do. And, and I'd be back up. No, no, I just couldn't stop. Full of life. I couldn't stop. Yeah, yeah no, that's I fantastic. couldn't stop. And riding racing as well then. That's, but, and the trainers were smarter than the owners. I mean, Jack Harvey was a dinner jacket every night at Slough, yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> the good, uh, I mean, everyone says, like, when I talk to my dad, they say the good old days. It wasn't like that. Well, a lot of things were bad, but things like that were yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. There yeah, were a lot of good. things bad. Can we just move on then, um, just to talk about a few of the facts? I mean, Jesus, I can't... I did look it up, how many... Um, Big races you've won. Oh, I don't know. We won two thousand three hundred anyway. Right, yeah. two thousand three hundred races. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. Can we just go through a few of them? I mean, I've not been in it long enough, but I can remember as far back as Bivitall. Yes, well, he was great, good sprinter. Um, he got better. He was difficult to train. He wasn't very sound, and in those days there were less things. But we had a pool. We got a swimming pool, and uh, he would not have done as well without. He became a fantastic stallion, better than I ever expected. Um, marvellous natured horse. Yeah, for someone like myself looking at what he actually achieved in racing, he, mm. he, he became much better at being a stallion. He was a better stallion. Yeah. yeah. He was, and he made Cheebly Park. And because of him, Cheebly Park have, were able to be the, the largest British breeders in, the, in yeah. Britain and keep everything going. So, you know, Pivotal was an important horse. Tell me a few... Tell me a, uh, a, a few that I wouldn't know from from like big winners. Well, I suppose the, the best was Red Camellia. She was the fastest. She was second in the French Guineas. Uh, she chipped her knee in the Phillies Mile, but otherwise was unbeaten. Every trainer you ask them, they nearly always say the best horse or the best dog was something you've never heard of. Yeah, but I've they been... thought he was the best. You know, yeah. I always remember a great greyhound trainer called um, Hartley Hawes who trained at Fordham and. Warrior sword, he said, that was the best dog I had. And I had to look it up, you know. <laughs> um, but all trainers have a weakness, I think, for the one that got away. And yeah. Red Camellia, I think, would have been that. And yeah. Last second was champion, uh, three-year-old filly in Europe. Um, Alborada won those two champion stakes. Um, I think the one who's often forgotten is Hooray. She won the Chibli part, four lengths. No horse has done that since the war. And she was champion, two-year-old filly of the world. I think everybody always thinks poor old Mark Prescott, all those stayers. <laughs> but we, we had Pivotal and Hooray. Well, let's, and let's, uh, let's, let's talk about the, one of the highlights of my racing career was standing in Tattersall's uh, when Marsha came into the ring. Yes, yes. And I've never seen anything like that. It was a great moment, wasn't it? It was, a, I mean, you must be able to get that up, but to be standing in amongst all them people, it was packed. It was absolutely packed. And the auctioneer was very good. 
and you'll remember this and when she got to five million or some staggering price I can't remember and he said just look at her gentlemen <laughs> and the whole place was silent and all you could hear was her feet walking round yeah and it was packed <laughs> yeah you know but it to give the, it his due he milked the drama it was the only fools and horses moment where someone yeah. was going <laughs> yeah that's right it was, um, it was a great moment and of course syndicate owned yeah yeah from you know yeah, from your point of view yeah elite. yeah, yeah. Well, and, although the uh, syndicate, i don't think the syndicate got the money no it. but they all knew that yeah yeah that everybody is, yeah, understood yeah. the terms yeah uh, there was a famous case which i certainly shan't name where the horse became very good and they suddenly found out they didn't own it. <laughs> um, but in the case of Elite, everybody everybody knew the rules yeah. and a bus, well, lo a bus load of them came when she was sold. Um, yeah. You know, it was tremendous. Yeah. And it'll keep Elite going, the stud, for however many years. So before that sale, when, when, when Marsha went in, obviously you didn't have a reserve. <laughs> No, we did. Four what million was, we had on. Oh, you had a reserve yeah, we of had four, four million. million yeah. Wow, that was... Um, how did you come to that figure? I thought she was sure to make four million. There was, um, uh, 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 I think it was a young, untried... There was. I had a benchmark that had made three or something, and I thought, this has got to make more. So I, I, I told them to put that on it. But it was a, a worrying time, because to make her make as much as possible... We, we were brave and we sold her as in training, which means you can return it for win, you can return uh, it. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. we went for broke on the basis that I thought she was perfect and she would not let us down. She wouldn't weave or box walk or crib or wind or... You know, do you see what yeah, I mean? He was confident. She, I, I had a lot of confidence in her, but my confidence <laughs> ebbed away when, <laughs> when she made so much money. And, the and thought, what, what was the final total? 6.6 .6 million, I think. 6.6 6 million. So she was the most expensive horse ever sold at auction in Europe, yeah. Wow, and still today? Still today, yeah. Wow. And Syndicate owned, so they had a yeah. fantastic journey with her. Yeah, yeah, no, because like, um, Luke was riding, so yeah. I had a lot of interest. Because... And, and she was a great specimen, you see. It's getting both, isn't it? A, I know, a, a it, very good specimen. In them days, I wasn't taking horse. that much notice. Yeah. But like... Now, she's absolutely correct. She was perfect. She was absolutely correct. And she stood down there faultless day after day, everybody poking her about her. You know, so uh, it was very exciting to... Uh, and what about the new superstar, I've got to say, Alpinista? Yes, well, she's done wonderfully well. Um, she's now won four group ones off, off the reel. Um, and... Um, She's um, only a little thing. She's not very is impressive. I've, I've not seen her. All my colleagues say, which is Alpinista, and when I say, they're all slightly disappointed. <laughs> um, but she keeps, she keeps going, and uh, her great attribute, like pile driver, really, is that she's straightforward. Yeah. And um, she's okay in the soft, and she's pretty good in the fast, um, and she's pretty uncomplicated touch wood. And she and she's a, she does the from trip. a great family. Yeah, so I trained her mother, her grandmother, and Mrs. her great um, grandmother. Miss, Mrs. Yeah. Ra Miss Rousing. Miss Rousing's yeah. family. Yeah. So I trained the the um, they all won group ones. Wow. So you know, and been she's a still got the. She, what is there any brothers or sisters? To yeah, she's got sex. And the reason why <laughs> Al, the reason why Alpinista keeps running. Yeah, and the reason why Albanova, who I trained the the uh, the grandmother, she won three group ones when she was five and the reason Miss Rousing can do that is because she's got so she's got so many at home if you had her Alpinista you'd have had to sell her yeah yeah um, but because Miss Rousing's got all the sisters and brothers and she wants Alpinista to run because she's promoting all yeah all the yeah, others yeah so she's able to keep racing these fillies much later yeah. than the most owners and she's had phenomenal success with these older fillies, um, not just with me, but Mr. Beckett has done wonderfully well, and um, and Mark Johnson with winning with four and five year old mares, group ones. Yeah, we actually bought a horse that turned out to be quite nice from Miss Rousing called Farquhar. Yes. Out of yeah. Archie Penko. Yes, yeah. Um, He's a good sire, wasn't he? It was yeah. a shame he died. Yeah. Um, Produced... Time Warp I had was by Archie Penko. That went to Japan or yeah, something? Yeah, it went to it? Hong Kong. Ah. I bought him off Miss Rousing. 26 or something like that 
and I sold him for an absolute fortune to Hong Kong. He'd won five races off the reel and that, you know, sold at the right moment. And I remember congratulating myself on this extraordinarily fine feat of training. And I think he won five million for them. In Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone was happy. So everybody was happy. Yeah. Yeah. We all did so. well. We all did well, including Miss Rousey, of course, who Heat and Dust, who won the other day as a half sister. Right. So she's worth a fortune. So, yeah, she's yeah. got a lot of lovely horses. Lovely horses, yeah, and, and does it well. Since well. I've been in it, uh, she's been building it up, building it up. Yeah. She just keeps going and going. And never spending big, big money at no. it, you know, uh, but working up and working up. Yeah. yeah. She must have quite a talent. She's, I know she's a wealthy lady, but oh, yeah. it's not always about money. No, no, she, and if she hadn't been born with it, she'd have soon made it. Yeah. Yes. Good, yeah, good. Yeah. No, she's always very. When I bought that horse, she came over and thanked me. And, yeah, yeah. And it was lovely. Yeah, so yeah, and follows them. You can't move a muscle without her knowing what's what's happening. Well, I'd like it at that time. Um, that was only a yearling when we bought it, and it was only me and Miss Rouse in bidding. Yeah, and that was my claim to fame that I outbid her. Yes, <laughs> and she was glad you did. <laughs> and she thanked me for yeah, it. She thanked you after it. Yeah. Um, so what, what about any other horses that would interest us? Because uh, uh, you've had so, so many, I know, but... Yeah, but, I mean, if you have 50, uh, most I ever had was 65. Um, as you know, with Miss Clovey, only one every two or three years is going to be good, good, aren't they? Come along. And, and the rest, you know, are important, but they're not going to be good, good. Yeah. And it's the good goods that people remember. Um, when all the trainers who worked for me, I think I've got 13 training in England, I think, who had two years with me, I've got 13 of them. And um, when they say they were with me, I always have to say, well, what horses were there? Because the date means nothing, but if they say, well, Alvarado and Pippa, yeah, then, you then I know exactly when they were yeah, when yeah. they were with me. I had a lovely thing the other day because the um, uh, BHA asked me to take out two Japanese people. I think they were running the race course out in Japan, all the training grounds. And uh, so I took the two people out and um, we went up Warren Hill. And standing on Warren Hill was, I think, William Haggis and Simon Crisford and Christian Wall. And they were all with me as boys, you see. So as I drove up the hill in my old Toyota with the two Japanese gentlemen, these three taking the mickey, they all sprang to attention and saluted <laughs> as soon as I went by. At the right so, time. So the Japanese man said, oh, ho, ho, ho. I said, they're just very minor trainers. I think one's called Haggis and Christopher. I don't, I don't really know. So anyway, on the way back down, I thought, I'll play this up. They were still there gossiping, you see. So uh, as I came by, I wound down the window. And so as I drove by very slowly, I said, take your fucking hands out your pockets when I walk, drive by. So the Japanese man, oh, he's so mark, he's so famous. <laughs> <laughs> so I pulled their legs when I next saw them, so I got sent all these Japanese horses because of you lot saluting me. You know. You're well known for that, though. So, uh, uh, like, obviously, we're at uh, our level of racing, um, we get to hear about lots of different trainers. Oh, and, of course, yeah. And it's like, you're a legend, really, for us to, to come here today and, and talk to you. And everybody that I've spoke to, I've, I've asked a lot of questions to people. Um, Gay um, Jarvis, yeah, she went to me. He's a big softy. Don't worry, you just <laughs> go down there. So we've come here today, and it's it's been fantastic. Well, it's been very nice. Um, to have you. Lastly, just before we go, I know it's a bit of a controversial thing, and it is for us at a low level of racing. Is how racing is being run at the moment in this country, and where you think it's going? I think it's very difficult to run it. Uh, I think they've got enormous problems, or we have all got enormous problems. Um, at the moment, very little is blowing our way. You've got the worry about the betting and what Parliament's going to do. You've got the worry about the animal rights. You've got the worry that the principal investors are quite elderly now. Uh, you've got worry about the foreign investment. Uh, and most of all, uh, the worry, I think, is the reduced coverage that racing is getting in the weekly papers, in the daily papers. Um, you know, you can hardly find it in... I remember the Telegraph having seven racing correspondents. Oh, yeah. You can hardly find it now. So we've got all these winds blowing against us. Uh, against that, there's lots of positives. We've got some very good young trainers. We've got 
uh, through Sheikh Mohammed, skip to be fair to him, through the, um, the program he set up. Um, uh, you've got young men being educated all over the world to see things. So we've got things blowing our way as well. Um, but the principal financial things are not going our way at the moment and therefore it needs really good management. <laughs> now, is the BHA managing it really well? I don't know. I think the the difference is that in the old days with the jockey club you had people who really, really understood horses uh, and probably didn't understand the modern uh, uh, balances, but they were well connected. They were well connected. And now you've got people who do understand probably promotion and one thing or another, uh, but they probably have a bit of a gap when it comes to understanding horses. Um, and it's hard to get both. Uh, I don't think it's an easy job, but I think, as in everything, a benevolent dictator is what we need. But it's hard to pull all the strands together. Yeah, that's what I noticed. There's, a, yeah. there's probably about 20 groups. Yes. The BHA, the ROA, this, the yeah. Horseman's Group, the Jockey, this. And, and it seems like there's too many. Yes. It seems it could be closed and, up and... And there's not a, a super ship to run it. And I've got to be honest, I don't know, and please tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me looking at our level, that there's lots and lots of money goes in and disappears and before it, it comes out. out. Yeah, yeah. And for us, as, for me as a business person, if you like, I look at that and think, why isn't it more transparent? Yes. You know when they give the, um, the ROA 1.2 million pounds and do a paper on how to get people back into racing? And it just maybe nothing seems to come nothing back. Nothing come back. No, no. And then they ask for more money and they yeah. are, and they, the BHA, I know, asked them for where the money had been spent, and they didn't come across. And we never, we never heard, did we? I, I didn't know that. I knew they'd asked the question. And they, no one, and they're asking for more. But it was, um, you know, when I started, it, it, it was run. The, the jockey club really did understand racing, so the racing problems were dealt with, I think, very well. And the interesting thing was that when the jockey club was disbanded voluntarily, don't forget it, 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 it disbanded itself. Uh, it, we were the only sport in which the professionals were happy to be regulated by the jockey club. You never heard a trainer say, I don't want to, uh, I want to, to have uh, universal stewarding, I want to have, you never heard anything. But was they all ex-jockeys and trainers and... Well, they, were, they understood it and they had a, diff, a distance from the people, from us. And they were very fair people. Um, and there were, you know, it, the, it was interesting that we were all happy to be regulated by them. The pressure to change came from outside, not from inside the sport, right. which is very unusual, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's normally the professional cricketers or yeah, the yeah. professional footballers, but yeah. we were happy to be regulated by the jockey club. So I think we, the horsemen, miss the jockey club. But against that, you know, we need to find the right people to, to run it on a commercial basis. And Peter Savile, he had a real good crack at it, you know. About I've heard that. Yeah, yeah he had a real good crack. And he's an he's an he's an owner that he's coming up again now. He's suddenly surfaced again. But you know, he worked six years for um, for nothing, running running the show, and he nearly nearly got there. But he famously got beat in Strasbourg, uh, and the the issue was who held the rights of all the race of all the race race uh, cards and so on. And if racing had managed to get that, and painfully, obviously, it did, but we got beat in Strasbourg, uh, then our finances would have been changed. So Sable nearly, nearly got us there. And he's back again. Though. And he's back again, probably. This too is the late. man that's just put the um, yeah. papers in. Yeah. yeah. But he, he wasn't everybody's cup of tea, but he, I, I saw him the other day a year, uh, at the sales in December, and I said, I want to thank you very, very much for what you... He so nearly got there. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. And that was probably the closest we're going to get to uh, it, to putting it all on a, on a proper footing. Yeah, the overall thing of all of this is, what worries me more than anything, is because we, as we're growing and we're doing quite well with our horse racing, I just worry that there's a lot of money going in. Hmm. It's not coming back out again. I worry that the, there's enough money in there now. It, yes, it, is there or isn't there? We just don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody they knows. say, the, the, well, every every race run gets 15,000 or something. Yeah. Um, but is the money going missing before it comes back out again? I, I don't know. 
I don't know. But I've always I've always kept clear of the yeah. racing politics, other than the things that affect Newmarket or, or the horse. So yeah. the whip rule, I, I felt strongly about, um, and you know they've given that a real go, but. Once you have a committee sitting for 21 months, they're bound to come up with the wrong answer. <laughs> They've got to come up with uh, You know, uh, it's just inevitable. I'm, that should have been I'm, a week. I'm grateful for them trying, but it would have taken half a page yeah. and, and uh, a week. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's Much just, just unbelievable. But once you start asking everybody, you like in your business or mine, if we said to all the staff, do you want to work Christmas Day? They'd all say no. Right? You know, yeah, you know. yeah. But I'm afraid you've got to do it to make the business go. Yeah, you know? yeah. 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 Well, it's been a a unbelievable. I'm, 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 I feel honoured, actually, to come here and see the stables. Like I say, I've drove past it. I've looked in there today, and I'm gobsmacked, to be fair. Well, you must have a proper look round one day. To be it? fair, your young lad, he walked me in, and I went, wow. And he went, I said that two years ago. He said, and I forgot about that. <laughs> yes, because everything you they take They see it, it and see it. And see it. it yeah. yeah, once you're used to it, you so, take it. But unbelievable. So thank you very well, much, Samar. Very thank good luck with your horses thank anyway. Thank you. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Clover's going great guns. Yeah, he's yeah. having a go, yeah. isn't he? Going great guns.